a very good day to you and welcome to the program. It is a beautiful, chilly <laughs> winter's morning. Our dear friend on Snowy is growing his winter coat, as you can see. And I've got a jacket on, but I want to tell you there is good news. And the good news is that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. I want to say to you right at the beginning, we're just going to have a short word of prayer. We have already prayed, but I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd watch over the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to speak to you today about the power of personal testimony. There's nothing more powerful than a personal testimony. And the first testimony we read about in the book of Acts, of course, is when the waiter, that's what he was, he wasn't an apostle, he wasn't a disciple, he was a waiter. He waited on the tables when he shared his testimony. And what happened after that? He was the first martyr in the New Testament. I'm talking about Stephen, that's right. If we go straight to the book of Acts chapter 6, and I'm reading two verses, verse 10 and then verse 15. Verse 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. And then we go down to verse 15. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. We're talking about the members of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin governed Israel. They had the power of life or the power of death over a person. And yet this waiter, he testified. There we go to the power of God, talking about the children of Israel right from the beginning, right from Abraham. And he had them transfixed. Why? Because the power of the word of God. See, people are not interested in what we say. They want to hear what Jesus said. Do you remember that old hymn? First verse goes like this. All of me and none of him. The second verse goes, some of me and some of him. And then the third verse goes like this, all of him and none of me. That is where we've got to get to. It's the power of the spoken word. I'm talking about Bible scripture that sets the captives free. Not William Shakespeare. Not Sigmund Freud, not any, not even Albert Einstein. It is the power of the spoken word of God which transfixes people. Okay, it, it's God's spoken word spoken to a people who are starving for the truth. I was told a long time ago that uh, educators complicate and communicators simplify. Stephen spoke a very simple message to the, the powers to be, the intellectuals of their time. They were transfixed. When they looked at him, they thought that they were looking at the face of an angel. Why? Because of Jesus Christ in him. You know that beautiful scripture, Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. It's Christ in you. That is the hope of glory. It's not you. It's Christ in you. They were mesmerized. That's the word. When they heard the answers and the testimony of that waiter by the name of Stephen. Why? Because you see, when Jesus talks, we need to listen up. When he talks about healing, when he talks about family, when he talks about business, he has the answers. And they're all in this book, folks. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. That's why the devil is trying so hard to stamp out the word of God, even in the church. I know a young man who had to relocate. 
And so he went to this city and he went to four different churches. This is what he told me. He sat down and he listened to the, 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 the preaching. He said in those four churches, the preacher never mentioned or read a scripture verse right through the whole message. I want to say to you, that is not a preacher. That is a motivational speaker. That is not a preacher of God's word. It's the word of God that sets the captives free. It's nothing else. You know, Billy Graham, and I know I, know I mention him a lot. He ran the full race, by the way. That's why I speak about him. I can't speak to about too many people who are still running that race because we don't know where they're going to end up. But he ran the full race. He died. He was going to be 100 years old. He died just before that. When he was a young evangelist, there were things in this book he didn't understand. So one night he walked out, I think it must have been a full moon, and he walked into a forest and he took his Bible and he opened it up and he put it on a tree stump. And then he got on his knees and he said, Lord, I don't understand everything in this book. But by faith, I am choosing to believe that every word in this book from Genesis right through to Revelation was written by men under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus Christ in print. I've told you that a thousand times. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I want to say to you today, nothing has changed. People are not interested in anything else. They want the Word of life because that is what sets the captives free. I really want to tell you today that in my humble opinion, there is nothing more powerful than personal testimony. When somebody stands up and he starts to tell you where he was, how he met Jesus and where he is now, there's nothing. In fact, that's how I got saved. I got saved in what the Methodist Church calls a lay witness weekend. It was laymen, building contractors, farmers, doctors, engineers, university students came to our little church in Great Town. And they got up on the Sunday morning and they started sharing their testimonies. I was sitting there, Jill and I, you know, you watch the movie Faith Like Potatoes, I'm sure. And I was spellbound when I saw big strong men getting up and then breaking down and weeping and saying, I was lost. I was an alcoholic. I used to beat up my wife or I was a thief and I, or I was a compulsive gambler. I even sold my own house to get money to gamble. Even sold my own wife's wedding ring. And I sat there, my mouth was hanging open, and then I met Jesus. And then they just break down, and through the tears and the, the nose running and weeping, they start to say how Jesus took us and he put us together. My wife was going to divorce me, but now we are more in love than the day we met. That is the power of a personal testimony. You need to tell people what Jesus Christ means to you. You see, the thing about a powerful testimony, my dear friend, is that no one can argue with you. <laughs> they can't argue with you. You know why? Because they weren't there. So they can only do one or two things. They can believe you or they can disbelieve you, but they cannot argue with you. They can take it or they can leave it, but they can't tell you that it was wrong because they weren't there. We need to speak up. We need to tell people what Jesus means to us. And to do that, we need faith. You see, the disciples were trying to tell Thomas, one of the, one of the disciples, that Jesus is alive. They said, Thomas, we've seen him. <laughs> and Thomas said, I'll believe it when I see it. Didn't he say that? Or words to that effect in John chapter 20 and verse 25. I'll believe it when I see it. And then Jesus just appeared in the room. He didn't knock on the door. He didn't walk through the door. He just appeared in front of Thomas. Because Thomas said, when I can put my fingers through the holes in his hands, and I can put my hand in the side where the spear pierced him, then I'll believe. And Jesus said, Thomas, come, put your finger through this hole. 
put your hand in the side. And he fell to his knees. Can you imagine? He was broken. He was a broken man. My God, he says. My Lord. He said, you say well, Thomas, because you've seen me. But blessed are those who come after you who have not seen me. And by the way, that's you and I. And yet still believe. The power of a personal testimony. It doesn't matter whether people say, I don't believe you. Tell them your story. It changed my life forever. Do you know that Saul of Tarsus was on his way to Damascus? We know it well. All of us. It's called a Damascus Road experience. That's what I had, by the way. But that's not the only way to get saved. On his way to Damascus to do what? To murder Christians. That is what he thought he had to do. Can you think of anything worse? Some of the most powerful testimonies I've ever heard spoken have come out of the mouths of men that I'd be too afraid to associate with before they became Christians. Yes, I'm talking about murderers who are in jail, who are serving a life sentence, and yet they've become Christians. Their testimonies make, they make me weep. I know that my Redeemer lives, as Job said, not just because of what I read, but because of what I've seen with my eyes. The power of personal testimony. Riding on his horse. Knocked off supernaturally in the middle of the day, by the way. And landing on the ground. And hearing a voice out of heaven. And by the way, no one else heard that voice. No one else heard that voice. Only Paul. Saul as he was then. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why are you persecuting me, Saul? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. The greatest apostle that I, I firmly believe that has ever lived. Yes, I'm talking about all the disciples. Paul, yes, Paul the apostle, who was Saul of Tarsus, has written most of the New Testament of this book. He suffered more than all of them. He says it, actually. He doesn't hold back. Stoned twice, shipwrecked, beaten, and eventually had his head cut off. We're talking about a man of men. And he was transformed in, a, in an instant. And of course, his testimony is transforming people even today. You can read it in Acts chapter 9. Saul, who became Paul, did a 180 degree turnaround. That's right. He was walking this way, and then he started walking that way. Just a minute before this program started, I got my cameramen and producers around me, and my sons in the Lord, and we listened to a six-minute testimony from a young farmer who has been completely transformed. A young man who tried to commit suicide shot himself twice with a, a shotgun, and he still lived. A man had been through car accidents, into alcohol, pornography, drugs, and he's come home. The prodigal son has come back. I want to tell you, we need to speak up. We need to tell people. Now, when I say that, I know there might be a young lady or a young man sitting there saying, but Uncle Angus, I don't have that kind of a past. I don't have that dramatic experience like John Newton who wrote... Um, Amazing Grace, a slave ship captain. You can't think of anything worse. And then he became a child of God and probably wrote the most famous hymn of all times, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound in a believer's ear. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I can see. Now that's a testimony. You might be sitting there and saying, but you know, I come from a Christian home and um, I, I, I can't relate to Having done anything dramatic, does that mean that I don't have a testimony? Of course it means you have a testimony. You don't have to sow your wild oats, as the saying goes, in order to have a good story. Not at all. It's not about that. It's about your walk with Jesus Christ. So don't feel condemned about that at all. But that still means you need to speak up and tell people what Jesus means to you. I want to say to some young budding preacher, if your testimony is 25 minutes B.C., before Christ, and 5 minutes A.D., after death, then you've got a useless testimony. It should be 5 minutes before and 25 minutes after. And I really want to stress that because some guys talk more about their past than they do about their present. That's not a testimony. 
That's giving the devil the glory, getting into all the gory details. We need to say what Jesus Christ means to us right at this very moment. I have a testimony. You've heard my testimony so many times. I will continue to share my testimony until the day Jesus Christ calls me home because it's the only thing I know. I'm not an educated man, but I have been to the school of hard knocks. I've made terrible mistakes. If I had to live my life again, I would not want to do any of those things because all they have caused me is pain and suffering and regrets. I don't want to do that. So in other words, young man, young lady, you don't have to go out and have your fun. This is what they say before you come to Christ, because there is no fun in sleeping with somebody who's not your husband or your wife, because you'll make, end up making them pregnant and then you'll marry them and then you'll wish you'd ever never done it or having that slight drink. Oh, it's just one drink and you didn't know that you were alcoholic, did you? Before you started drinking. I'm talking about real things here. Or just taking that, um, that one uh, draw of marijuana and saying, well, that's all I'm going to do. It won't be because it's an addiction. You see, folks, I want to say something to you seriously. You don't have to have a bad past to have a good testimony. No. Don't even go there. Don't even try it. And don't go and mix with people and say they're not going to change me. They will change you. You really need to start walking with Jesus Christ. Like never before have I ever seen such temptation that is in the world as now. You know, in the days we were talking about Billy Graham a few minutes ago, there were no cell phones there. Now you've got young children who are not even teenagers who are getting exposure and being exposed to things like pornography and all kinds of antichrist things. We even see it in cartoons. It is wicked, and I'm using that word carefully. We need to have a good testimony because when people hear and see a genuine testimony, it changes their lives. And that's what happened. That's what the disciples did. They went out into the whole world and they shared their testimony. What was it? The Lord died. We were there. And He rose again. And if He rose again, He defeated death. He defeated sin. So all we have to do is what? Is repent, which is to say sorry, to stop it and start again. There's no other religion in the world that can offer you that because there's no other God outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to say to you today, my life was transformed on this farm. That's right. On the 18th of February, 1979, this man was broken. I had worked myself literally to the bone. And I've shared with you before about the addiction of hard work. A lady actually wrote to me not so long ago and said, please, could you share a thought for the day and tell the people of the danger of work addiction? Because if you're working yourself to death, you've got no time for your family, you've got no time for your children, you've got no time for anybody. And you keep telling everybody you're doing it for your family. It's lies, I tell you, because I used to do that. I would come home at night and Jill had already put the children to bed. I left in the morning before the sun came up, before the children woke up. On the weekends, I was working because cows were carving down and we had bushfires or floods or whatever. And Jill would say, Angus, can't you spend a little bit of time with us, with the family? And then I would get very impatient with Jill and say, Jill, I'm doing this for you. I wasn't doing it for them. I was doing it for my own ego so that men would drive onto this farm and say, look at the fences. They're so nice and straight. And look at the maize. It's in full, full bloom. And look at the cattle. They're fat. It was for me. I want to tell you that on the 18th of February, 1979, I came to grips with myself. You see, I got to the stage where I couldn't sleep at night. Maybe you've been there. It's called insomnia. I just could not switch off the engine. It was like my foot was on the accelerator. The engine was screaming and it was into the red and it was going to blow up and I couldn't do anything about it. I even went to a doctor. He gave me tranquilizers. I said, what are these? Now, this was quiet you down. Now, I come from the old school. I didn't realize that a lot of men take those things. I thought it was only women. And that's no dis disrespect to the ladies. When I went to that church service and I saw these men getting up and these women, these young people giving their testimonies, I was lost. 
I gave my life to Christ and my life was transformed. I realized there was hope for me. They made a simple altar call, asked us to come forward. I went forward, Jill, myself, my children. We bowed the knee. I prayed the sinner's prayer. I saw no lightning. I heard no thunder. I saw nothing like that. But I knew in my heart that today I'm handing over everything to God. It changed my life forever. And that was almost 44 years ago. I want to say to you that Jesus can do it for you as well. Now I'm going to pray for you. I don't always do this, but I feel led by the Holy Spirit to pray for you because you need to start testifying. That's where the power is. Who must I talk to? I'm not a preacher. Talk to the person you work with. He should know that you're a Christian. Talk to the, the, the students that you meet with. Talk to the farmers at the Farmers Association meeting. Takes courage, eh? Oh, tell me about it. And some of them will laugh at you and some of them will say, well done, but it's not for me. But you need to tell them and you'll be surprised how they will change. A simple testimony. So I want you to pray this prayer with me. And then I want you to go out and I want you to tell the first three people that you meet after this message what you've done. You've given your life and everything you have to Jesus Christ. Let us pray. I'm going to pray slowly. Dear Lord Jesus, that's right, you pray this after me. Today, I repent of doing things my own way, and I ask you to be the Lord of my life. I don't want any other gods. I'm not looking to anyone else or anything else, Lord, but to you. Please forgive me for being so selfish. That's right, selfish. Today, I have made a decision to follow you until you come to take me home to be with you in glory forever. I will serve no other gods, only Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, there we have it. You've prayed the prayer. How did that feel? You say, I didn't feel anything. That doesn't matter. The fact is you've done it and Jesus has heard it and so is the devil. And he is just now, all those chains that have been holding you back are broken. Now walk away and never look back again. Because I want to tell you something now. No man putting his hand to the plow, and I know about plowing, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. You can't go backwards. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You'll find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Until we meet again, God bless you. Goodbye.